Like them or lump them, the lightweight, low-powered Roadster is a quintessentially British design that allowed anyone to feel like they were in a high-powered sports car for a fraction of the price. From the 1950s through to the turn of the 1980s, the UK rode high through the likes of Triumph, Jensen, MG, Austin Healey, TVR and Reliant, to name just a handful, with the design perhaps perfected by Lotus when they launched their Elan in 1962. Despite its diminutive size, the car put Lotus on the map and sold between 8,000 and 12,000 units in total, depending on who you ask, during a highly successful 11-year production run. Unfortunately, the safety regulations started to rear their ugly head and the British car industry was ravaged by its competition, outdated manufacturing tools and principles, strikes and bankruptcies, as well as some embarrassing flops that destroyed their reputation. The fabled sports car started to disappear during the 1970s, a surmounting loss which was exacerbated during the following decade. All these factors, along with British Leyland seemingly passing on every single good idea its designers came up with, because it could either not afford it, or decided they'd rather reheat something pre-existing for the umpteenth time, spelled the slow, but inevitable total decline of the British automotive industry. Though the relaunched Lotus Elan had shown some initial promise when it first launched in 1989, it was hampered from the get-go due to its unconventional front-wheel drive layout and the car's expensive development costs, which resulted in just 4,000 cars being made, with an additional 800 being made from surplus engines once Romano Artioli stepped in during the mid-1990s. After the Elan, which had cost the equivalent of £100 million or $136 million in today's money to develop, was embarrassingly pawned off to Kia, a few more cars tried to reclaim the throne for old Blighty. There was the TVR Griffith and its replacement the Tamora, which combined a small frame with a big engine and was quite a handful to drive. MG briefly revived its MGB platform into the V8-powered RV8, the majority of which were oddly sold in Japan, before launching its MGF to great fanfare in 1995. Though its sales figures remained comfortably over 10,000 units during its initial 10-year production run, it wasn't the runaway success that MG Rover had initially hoped for. Then there was the revived Jensen Mark, which was beset by constant troubles that aren't too dissimilar to the way the story regarding the revitalised TVR Griffith appears to be suffering from, with only a handful of its striking SV8 being produced following the company falling into administration in 2002. If it's any form of a silver lining, the car would be one of the playable vehicles in the 2002 Team Soho developed video game The Getaway for the PlayStation 2. AC had always been a constant presence, continuing to build its world-renowned Cobra all the way through to the turn of the millennium, but it too would go the way of the Dodo as its failed reinvention under the Pride Auto Group and subsequently Autocraft led to its new owner, Brian Anglis, liquidating most of his assets due to the likewise expensive development costs of a redesigned AC Ace, which would be unveiled at the 1993 London Motor Show. Though the car drummed up some interest due to its name, styling, and futuristic all-aluminium construction, the car proved too pricey to effectively market in much the same vein as the Elan. Even bigger companies weren't immune to this seeming failure to get off the line. Caterham, who practically founded their company for its purchase of Lotus's 7 in 1973, and has consistently remained one of the country's strongest independent manufacturers, failed to get their much-touted 21 out of the gate despite a successful early career in motorsport. Jaguar would show off its gorgeous XK180 in 1999, which eventually morphed into a proposal for an E-Type successor, which would be put on bricks the year after that. As each of these ventures rose and fell accordingly, it seemed unlikely that the British sports car industry would ever begin to mount any sort of recovery, but there was one glowing exception, Noble. Noble proved it was possible to run a successful sports car company on a budget, using plastic bodies built in South Africa and mercilessly raiding the parts bins for anything they could get their hands on. This included, quite crucially, the brake lights and V6 Duratec engine from the Ford Mondeo ST200. In its stock, naturally aspirated guise, the engine was capable of a rather anemic 165 brake horsepower, but Noble would mount twin turbochargers, virtually doubling its power output. The result was one of the wildest and fun-to-drive cars money could buy for less than £50,000, a price it has maintained 20 years since its production. It would be heralded and acclaimed by car journalists worldwide, who praised the car's handling, performance and styling, despite an R&D department that was a fraction of the size that the big boys had. What was instrumental in Noble's success was Lee Noble's relentless assault on the motoring media at large. For the first half of the 2000s, there wasn't a magazine, motoring journal, webpage or car show out there that didn't dedicate something to the M12 and its successor, the M400. Without television advertising or a high-profile presence in motor racing, 
Noble achieved the same amount of media coverage as an established mark and were able to build around 700 cars in its eight years of production, which would be followed by an additional 75 Russian Q1s built in America once the designs were sold off. Obviously, with the success enjoyed by Noble and the gaps within the British car market continuing to widen as more and more older models were taken out of production, there were many imitators eager to get out of the starting gate, none more eager than the company by the name of FBS, which stood for the future of British sports cars. The company's two founders, Andrew Barber and Robin Hall, had been engineers on BMW and Rover's joint project on the Mini Reboot, which had just freshly concluded with Frank Stevenson's polarising design the eventual winner. With the design complete, they were now free to do whatever they wanted. The origins of their FBS prototype can be traced as far back as 1993, as that is when Hall and Barber began discussing the idea of building their own car, an idea which was overheard by colleague Eddie Powell. Powell decided that he had heard enough and challenged them to make their car if they were so certain in their beliefs regarding vehicle dynamics, and for the next seven years, development on their prototype would slowly evolve and progress. With the finished Mini set in stone, the pair could work full-time on their project, and Powell would soon join them, becoming a shareholder in the company. In late 1999, the pair would meet up with investors at an Equity Ling Investors Fair to secure funding for their prototype, which they would initially dub the FBS-1. At this point in time, the car was little more than a chassis, wheels and an engine, all of which were designed via CAD through Katia V5, with as much of its minimalist construction outsourced to the parts bins of various bigger manufacturers, which was totally the right call to make as a brand new startup which was finding its feet. To give the company some further credit, they had done their homework on building a driver's car, as they had specifically designed the seating and steering around those of the Vauxhall Vectra SRI and the Ford Focus Mark I, which would have been very familiar to avid drivers of the era. Furthermore, its configuration of a double wishbone suspension pairing soft springs with hard damping and centred around a rigid monocoque steel safety shell formed the beginnings of a very impressive package, but the car was still lacking one of its most crucial elements, its body. More importantly, it needed a body that was reminiscent of British sports cars from years gone by, to instil the company's future with the spirit of the past. A design contest was held at the University of Coventry, with 11 finalists, and the eventual winner was penned by Italian designer Giovanni Doglioli, who had interned at Pininfarina and would later help design cars such as the Ferrari GTC4 Lusso under the tutelage of Flavio Manzoni. Unfortunately, though the design looked quite good on paper and as a scaled-down model, echoing the same bubbly Lotus Elan styling cues that had made the Mazda MX-5 such a rampant success, the execution of the design was less than satisfactory, and critiques were soon levelled against the car's styling, which may have been its greatest Achilles heel. As you'll see later on, even Tiff Nidell struggled to complement the seemingly haphazard afterthought that was the car's rear fascia which paired an oddly positioned taillight cluster against an unsightly, bulbous rear bumper with tiny exhausts protruding from it. Regardless, the car was soon riding a wave of positive feedback, and in June of 2000, the company completed a £250,000 investment deal with two unnamed business angels, and managed to show off its prototype, which made a brief cameo appearance in a September episode of Top Gear. FBS would head into 2001 as a potential rising star in the world of sports cars, as the first two production examples were built and sold in May and June of that year, with full-time production expected to start that July. The company had lofty ambitions of building a further five cars before the end of the year, before jumping to 40 in 2002 and over 70 in 2003. Again, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary at this point. The company had started offering test drives in October 2001, and company founder Andrew Barber would regularly post on piston heads boasting of his company's early successes under the online alias Joe90. Only in 2002 is it where things start to unravel. First of all, though the company did seem to be on target for its low 2001 production figures, it took them the entire first half of 2002 to deliver the first pair of customer cars, which they would deliver that June and July. They'd make appearances at the Oxford and Birmingham International Motor Shows in June and October of that year, and in April 2002, FBS would pair up with the similarly named FSB, offering a Census V6 as a prize at the Hertfordshire County Show the following month. Even as late as early 2003, the company seemed to remain in high spirits despite failing to fulfil their intended sales quota of 40 cars for the year prior, shifting about one car each month. Though it was never publicly admitted, on top of its styling, what the car lacked, which was ironic given its name, was exposure. Despite its TV and motor show appearances, it's evident that not a lot of people were aware of the car's existence, 
and to improve the car's chances, they needed to go nationwide with an actual brick and mortar dealer network, as well as join the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, which crucially gave the company a foot in the door for the entire country's automotive industry, and possibly an inroads into Europe. Again, FBS achieved both of these goals, and along with its SMMT membership, united with McDonald Racing, a Morgan specialist located in County Durham with a pre-existing network. In February 2003, the company started to diversify with the announcement of the FBS Census R, a stripped-down race day version of its Census V6. It boasted improved weight distribution, higher torque, and increased rigidity, along with prerequisite safety equipment which allowed it to be used as a track day car, along with some optional performance upgrades that the company offered. However, from what I can find out, no Census Rs outside of this one alleged demonstration unit were ever built. In May, FBS and its census made an appearance at Millbrook Proving Ground for the experimental car show Motor Drive Live, which allowed customers to actually test drive the cars they would normally only be able to look at. Unfortunately, I've been unable to find any photographic resources from this event, but there is plenty about it on the internet and had its presence graced by many large manufacturers, drawing oneself to the conclusion that it was at least somewhat a success. But it didn't really help improve FBS's fortunes this late in the game. In June 2003, the car would appear on the Graham Norton show, though it's unknown as to why and whether or not it was in an official capacity. Supposedly, two were on the stage, washed by father and son pairs who were apparently starkers aside from the waist. The car would go on to make its last official appearance at Piston Fest 2003, which happened at the end of June. Its appearance at this show was the last documented time anyone would hear about the company or its car, as FBS would announce it was restructuring that August, shortly before officially declaring bankruptcy less than a month later. A month after the car's final TV appearance, Robin Hall would be contracted by Land Rover to work on a new foundation braking system, which he spent over a year working on. Though he doesn't disclose the exact car he was contracted for, judging from the time frame and knowing that it was a luxury 4x4 vehicle produced by Land Rover, it's very likely that the car Hall worked on was the Range Rover Sport, which launched in early 2005, proving that the census was competently engineered at the very least. With Hall now moonlighting for Land Rover and FBS failing to secure the financial restructuring it needed, the company inevitably fell apart. The official website received a final update around September 2003, before moving away to an independent homepage, which is never a good sign. What's funny is this website was already offline by the beginning of 2005, whereas the company's official website remained online through to the summer of 2008. Regardless, by 2005 the company was no more and neither was its car. It had enjoyed a tumultuous four years, but it ended up on the scrap heap. Robin Hall would go on to found Edge Sports Cars, which saw a similar degree of success, and for us, that's where the story ends, at least in a public capacity, because the company would issue heaps of promotional material for its car, including a very rare CD-ROM, which I've come into possession of thanks to donations from my first two videos. The disc itself is nothing to really write home about. It's your standard printed disc. On the back, it's TDK, indicating that it was a mass-produced CDR. And they probably made maybe a hundred of these, a few hundred, a thousand. Very, very rare. It's the only one I've ever seen on eBay, and I've been looking at it for a few months now. It's probably even the same vendor. So this is insanely rare. Right, so here we are. Run FBS Twin.exe. Let's see if it runs on 64-bit. Wow, that's interesting. So we're up to the main menu now. We've got a picture of the FBS census. You've got two extracts here. You can click between these three buttons. One says pulling power, one says evolution of the census, and the other says top gear. I think the first thing that we want to look at here is the evolution of the census because that's the thing that isn't video-based, or at least I assume isn't video-based, so I should be able to narrate it a bit better than the other two. So here we are, we've got the logo of the FBS sensors, we've got three cars, I presume these were all development mules, I know the yellow one was, they call it production car number one, and it was in fact discovered a few years ago, it was sold on eBay. Unfortunately, that eBay listing has long since expired, so you only get a single low-resolution shot of it looking quite worse for wear, but that car does indeed still exist, contrary to what Andrew Barber said a few years ago. So here we are, production car number one. It's the yellow car with the black hubcaps, the black steelies. Yep, I think I've seen this picture before, but without that blur filter around it, it's parked next to a bunch of lotuses. Uh, this third picture, I believe I've seen this before, but in a more compressed, squished format. And I've, it looks like we're back to the first picture again. 
So we go back, back to the menu, car 2. This is the one that attended the car shows, I believe. The NEC, possibly, or Earl's Court, I'm not 100% sure here. But we've seen this picture before. Right, this is new, I definitely haven't seen this picture before. This is a picture of what the car looked like on the inside. So that's it, that's production car number 2. Production car number 3, we know this one already, that's the O2 Reg in this weird grey-green metallic colour. So, yeah, we've got this photo of it presumably outside the headquarters. I'm not 100% sure on that. We've got this other photo of it at what is presumably its delivery address or outside the homes of one of the people responsible for it. Here it is again in a similar setting, probably part of the same photo shoot. And here's another photo of its dashboard, which that looks to be more a unique one, or it may just be a different angle. And, yeah, the very infamous shot of its rear end there. Ooh... If the front was a sight for sore eyes, the rear, unfortunately, is even worse. It looks like someone took the Renault Megane from the early 2000s and the Mitsubishi Eclipse from the late 90s, mixed them together in a blender, got rid of all the stuff that made those lines work on those cars, so admittedly on the Megane they were a bit... Bleh, and then just kept all the bad stuff. So you've got... They, it looks bloated. It looks honestly awful. It looks like something out of a video game, like Saints Row or something. But I digress. I shall return now to what the plans for the fourth production model was. So second then, I thought it had just disappeared. But yeah, this is allegedly the next stage. They did have a few other cars planned, FBS, along with the normal production run, such as the FBS Census R, which I believe I might have covered by now. This was a racing variant, or at least a turbocharged variant, that never got off the ground. They showed it during early 2003, to be honest, we're not even sure if it's even a car that was made or just one made to look like what the finished product may have been, because they had a lot of inconsistencies between cars. I mean, even here you can see that production car number two had a silver grille, and number three had a plain black grille. And of course, the wheels changed between the earlier models and the later models. Well, not really so much later models, it is final models. Final models had a more spoked wheel design. Whereas the first few cars had the five spokes. So number four, here's the uh, frame of the car. Not really much to say. It's a steel safety monocoque, I believe it was referred to in the documentation of the car. And is that it? Hold on, I'll try and advance it along. Yeah, that is it, actually. So they just, for some reason, as they were building their fourth car, they just took a bunch of photos of the chassis before it was even properly built. That's a bit of a shame, actually. I was expecting we'd follow the whole construction of the car from the chassis upwards. The engine, the interior, the bodywork. So that's a bit of a shame. But I guess they had to get these discs out in time for whatever motor show they were probably sold at. So we've now seen all four of the cars, so we're going to go back to the main menu here. So now let's look at the extract of pulling power. So this has not been seen since 2002, probably, because anything that wasn't Top Gear is very scarce outside of the programs released by Men and Motors because they were gracious enough to put them all online in the last few years. Pulling Power, on the other hand, has virtually disappeared off the face of the earth. In fact, according to most people, Pulling Power didn't even exist until 2005, which is odd considering I found extracts and even whole episodes from as far back as the mid-1990s. So that definitely requires further investigation, I think. So here we are, let's load up the pulling power footage. Hopefully this doesn't cause my machine to crash, otherwise we'll have to extract it and manually view it later on. Ah, here we are. Ooh, that is very compressed. I was actually kind of hoping it was just shrunk, but unfortunately the video footage does seem to be very compressed. And of course the frame rate is reduced as well. Still, it's quite nice that we have this footage. Because it probably hasn't been seen for the best part of 20 years. So at this point, yeah, they've put it up against the BMW Z3. That's quite a humorous comparison, considering the Z3 was a much more refined, proven design that had been out for a few years and had many more examples readily available. Oh. In fact, it's so new, you won't even and see thing it on is the road The census inherently time. wasn't a bad car, car from what I've heard. Today it was fine to drive. Prototype. It's just they slacked in virtually every other aspect, right and that is what made the difference in the end. Tell me about this very distinctive sports car. 
Well, we're the people that design it, myself and my business partner, we're engineers, uh, so we contracted out the styling to the experts at Coventry University, World Centre on it. We asked them for something distinctive, and something modern. And this is modern. very distinctive, isn't it? I mean, it look is. Look at this now, it's very aggressive as well. Almost. Indeed, in, in playing that big Ford V6 in the front, driving these rear wheels here. <laughs> and a muscular rear end as well. Plenty of muscle, big twin Completely ignoring the facts. As I said before, it's like a cross between an Eclipse and a Megane with none of the good bits. Uh, two thin exhaust tips sticking out of the rear bumpers, almost like an afterthought, really. Thanks very much, Andrew. Well, this is the first time I've driven off in a car when the man who's designed it and built it is standing right behind me. I better not stall it. Yeah, the driving experience is something that is very touted in regards to the sensors. The driving position, seating position, these were carefully refined over the course of years to make sure they were perfect. Unfortunately, that's pretty much the only thing that the car perfected. At the moment, the model I'm driving it's just a prototype, but they're making the production car as we speak. And they're hoping to sell about 70 a year. And the great news is, if you live down in the I, mean, I just, I just cannot see how this car flopped as hard as it did. I mean, everything was there for it. During the last year, they made sure to secure everything they possibly needed, like a dealer network with Morgan. So to see how far the company regressed in such a short period of time, it's kind of sad to see, really. Because if this company had worked out, it probably would have gone a similar route as Noble or early 2000s TVR pre-Smolensky buyout. I mean, from a distance, the car styling isn't even that bad. It's only really when you get up close that the disproportionateness of the whole design really makes itself apparent. Like the wideness of the nose, for instance. The size of the headlights isn't quite right. The wideness of the body in proportion to its length. And of course that rear, as well as the scalloping across the sides. It just doesn't really work. And yeah, I should have mentioned it earlier, but in case you're wondering, uh, these videos will be put up as a patron's bonus and eventually made available to the rest of the viewers who aren't subscribed in due time. Now we're in the Z3, and from what I've heard, a lot of people didn't like the seating position of the Z3. It felt a bit weird. It said, I think Glockson once said, that it felt as though you were riding on top of the car rather than inside the car. So I've got a bit of an action shot here with the sensors. And if after all this you're still wondering what FBS stands for, well it stands for Future British Sports Car. And who knows, if enough people park with their 25 grand plus for this motor, then one day it might just be as common on our roads as some of its competitors. And that looks to be it. Yep, that's it. So now we'll just back it out. Wait for the disc to reload again, and now we'll watch the Top Gear clip. And I have a bit of background to this clip. I know it's from a repeat from UK Horizons, the UK TV channel, which is a bit odd because if I were a car manufacturer, I'd want the raw footage from the broadcaster. So I would have approached the BBC, said my car was featured in this episode, and actually got the raw footage from BBC Two. So we'll just load this up now, and you'll see it's from a re-airing. The original air date was 8th of November 2001, but since it's from UK Horizons, it's probably from a few weeks later, maybe even a few months later. ...investment through the government-backed Business Link scheme and set up their own company, FBS. And yeah, they're outside of the FBS Cars factory. I've recognised this place from a couple of photos before, including one that was on the disc. So here, presumably, Robin Hall is explaining how the car was designed on CAD. That's one of the main selling points of the car. That is, in my opinion, one of the few things the company did right to design design it on CAD because that was the future at the time. They're looking at the brakes here. Now I did mention that Robin Hall worked on the Range Rover Sport braking system after leaving FBS cars in late 2003. We have some promotional material here and a mock-up of the finished design. Here they're assembling a chassis. In fact, to be honest, this footage here is more interesting than the rest of what's on the disc because we're actually the seeing the design the documents and the cars being built. For the car, which, to be honest, this is quite underwhelming in its aspect. From Ford, uh, some parts of it from MG, and uh, other parts are generic just from suppliers who supply the whole industry. On first sight, there also seems to be a familiarity to the shape of the sensors. Those headlights certainly have a hint of Alpha GTV, 
and that rear, a touch of TBR Tamora perhaps? The styling was a result of a competition we ran at Coventry University. We had 11 proposals from postgraduate students uh, and the winning design was by a guy called Giovanni Doglioli, who's Italian obviously, uh, and happens to have done a lot of work at Pininfarina as well. So now Tiffany Dell's taking the car out for a spin around the English countryside. It's raining, I don't think the company planned on that. But of course, it's a bit different from the previous test drive. I guess that counts for something. The census costs £25,750 and they need 50 customers. Yeah, Top Gear in the late 90s, even the early 2000s, they were really big on this type of shot. Like, the cameraman stood on the road outside aiming down towards the road, pointing upwards, long distance shots. They were really big on it. Even the first few years of when Top Gear had turned, they had this sort of shot. And I am certain I've seen this road before on other test drives. It looks very familiar. So again, he looks quite enthusiastic here. Again, I can't tell for sure, but he looks quite pleased with it. He's thrashing the car as hard as he can on these roads. And the car does look very planted to the ground from the way it turns. And once you wind that red counter around the clock, the two and a half litre V6 Duratec engine sounds really encouraging as well. Producing 170 horsepower in a lightweight chassis, there's performance aplenty. This is a real driver's car that instantly asks you to get on and drive it. Yep, here we go, all the power slides in the world. These action shots that obscure half the car. Going around the airfield, and that really does look like Dunsfall. I mean, it's probably Kemble, because I don't think Dunsfall was open to the public at this point, even as late as late 2001, so this is probably Kemble. We'll have to confirm for sure if anyone recognises the airfield. Okay. So yeah, here's your typical Tiffany Dell fare here, really getting the car sideways, and you can see he's enjoying it, he's really planting the car where he wants it. It's not at all out of control, I mean look, he's doing these manji drifts here, and he's keeping the car in line. Obviously in a car with worse handling you wouldn't be able to do this, and that was a completely controlled 360. He veered around a little bit, but that's probably because he wasn't fully intent on completing that manoeuvre, it's just, again, a testament to how well this car handled. I mean, if anything, through watching the contents of this disc, it seems they really had a good thing going. It's just that, at the end of the day, handling isn't everything. You've got presentation to consider, you've got styling to consider. There, yeah, look, he's comparing it to the Noble M10, and of course, the story of the Noble M10 was completely different to the FBS census. I mean, the Noble M10, that was sort of a failed launch for Noble, they only made a handful of these cars, they were woefully underpowered, and they didn't really get the company anywhere, which is why they made all these changes with the M12 GTO in 2000, and of course that car became a worldwide success. It put Noble on the map, they built over 700 of them. So maybe if FBS had a little bit more money and were focused on building a successor, the car could have been more than it was. So, after all that, how and why did the FBS census fail? No one seems to know for sure. Perhaps it was the unimaginative name, or perhaps it was the undesirable styling. Maybe the company just didn't have enough money to continue building its cars after the first few examples had sold, or perhaps they didn't know how to effectively manage a car company. By the time the car made its silver screen debut in 2004, which remains its sole movie appearance to this day, it was long gone. Maybe if the company had set its sights a little higher and went after the likes of Noble and TVR, they would have had some more success, based on how the Noble M10 faltered and sold only a handful of units before the M12 and M400 became much bigger successes. Perhaps it was the lack of brand identity which killed the census harder than anything else. FBS sounds more like an insurance firm or large store that sells you furniture rather than a car manufacturer. Something within the manufacturing, distribution, or business side of the enterprise went awry that led to the company shutting its doors in late 2003. Personally, I would love to hear from Andy, Robin, or anyone else who was involved with the company to get some definitive answers. If either of them are around, or if there's anyone in touch with them, I would like to know more. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to see more videos like this, please consider donating via my Patreon or Ko-Fi links.
All support is very much appreciated, no matter how small. See ya!